Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, good evening and a welcome, a warm welcome to each of our well over 300 people gathered to hear this much anticipated lecture. As many of you know, Lancaster history is in the early phases, planning phase for a major undertaking, the creation of the Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith historic site and museum with the expectation that we'll, we be, we'll bring it to fruition within the next 24 months. It's only fitting that we would feature today's speaker, historian, Dr. Bruce Levine. Dr. Levine is no stranger to Lancaster uh, and Lancaster history, having appeared a few years ago at a major symposium um, on the legacies of two of Lancaster's uh, most notable political figures, James Buchanan and Thaddeus Stevens. Dr. Levine has also been a major contributor to the Humanities Advisory Council, which we have assembled uh, to help guide this new project. Thanks to a major grant support from the High Foundation locally and the National Endowment for the Humanities nationally. Dr. Levine is the best selling author of five books on the Civil War era, including The Fall, The House of Dixie, and Confederate Emancipation, which received the Peter Seaborg Award for Civil War Scholarship and was named one of the top 10 works of nonfiction in its year by the Washington Post. He's Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Illinois. His most recent book and the topic of this evening's presentation is Thaddeus Stevens, Civil War Revolutionary Fighter for Racial Justice. It's just been published by Simon & Schuster and it's my pleasure to present Dr. Bruce Levine. Bruce. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. I'm just gonna jump right in. In the summer of 1863, the third year of the Civil War, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee launched his famous raid into Pennsylvania that culminated in the epic Battle of Gettysburg. And during that raid, one of Lee's division commanders, General Jubal A. Early, looted and demolished the Caledonia Ironworks that was located just outside of that town. The man who owned those ironworks was the specific personal target of that attack. He was the Republican congressman named Thaddeus Stevens. General Early said that he regretted only that he hadn't actually encountered Stevens himself on the premises. Because if he had, he swore, the general swore, he would have moved then and there to hang him, divide his bones, and send them to the several Confederate states as curiosities. Jubal Early declared that he had destroyed those ironworks to make an example of Stevens because, said Early, Stevens had inflicted more damage on the Confederacy than had any other man in the United States Congress. Now, a very different man, Frederick Douglass, the former slave and abolitionist leader, agreed with Jubal Early about almost nothing. But he did second that general's appraisal of Thaddeus Stevens' importance. Douglas said of Stevens that there was in him the power of conviction, the power of will, the power of knowledge, qualities that at last made him more potent in Congress and in the country than even the president and the cabinet combined. I began this project with two questions in mind. First, what role did this remarkable individual, Thaddeus Stevens, play in the unfolding of the second American revolution? That is, what role did he play in the destruction of slavery during the Civil War and Reconstruction? And the second question was, why and how did someone become that revolutionary figure 
in the first place. Eventually, I recognized that answering both of those questions required understanding the relationship between individuals and their environment, between individuals and their specific, specific historic setting. At the heart of Stephen's own individual story is the interaction between early influences that shaped his early values on the one hand and the way in later life he responded to the escalating national conflict over slavery on the other hand. Those early influences upon him helped to determine how he would respond later on but those later responses also modified who he was as an individual. To grasp how he influenced the national conflict over slavery requires recognizing that as a political figure, he gave voice to that conflict's own inner logic. It required recognizing how he understood and translated into clear words and clear actions, what Frederick Douglass called, quote, the inexorable logic of events, end quote. The irresistible logic of events, the unavoidable logic of events. It was by giving voice to that logic that Stevens could point the way forward to his party and his country. Now, I had long thought Thaddeus Stevens was one of the most interesting, influential, and colorful figures in US history. He became a full-fledged, active, ardent abolitionist decades before the Civil War, during the mid-1830s at a time when only a tiny and widely despised handful of white people espoused that abolitionist creed. And at that early date, he stood not only for the prompt abolition of slavery, but also for equal rights for African Americans, including the right to vote for African American men. In the 1830s, as a delegate to a constitutional convention in his adoptive state of Pennsylvania, a convention that was charged with the responsibility for drawing up a new state constitution. He refused to endorse the finished product of that convention because precisely it denied equal voting rights to black men. And during the 1840s, his home evidently became a station in the Underground Railroad. Soon after that, he defiantly opposed the famous Compromise of 1850. Abraham Lincoln, by then a former congressman from the state of Illinois, defended that congressional compromise because it seemed to save the union from possible rupture even at that point. But Congressman Thaddeus Stevens denounced that compromise because it allowed slavery to spread into new land and because it made it easier for slaveholders to recapture those African Americans who had managed to escape slavery and make their way into the North. The next year, 1851, Stevens served as a defense attorney in a very high profile case about escaped Maryland slaves, fugitives who, when discovered in Pennsylvania, resisted being recaptured with arms in hand and killed the man who claimed to own them and had chased them down. Between 1854 and 1856, the anti-slavery Republican Party came into being, pledged first of all to prevent slavery from spreading into all existing and all potential future federal territories. Thaddeus Stevens soon joined and helped to build that party. And that party sent him back to Congress in 1858. There in Congress, 
he managed simultaneously to become both a central leader of his party as a whole and a fiery spokesman for that party's more radical wing. And when the Civil War erupted in 1861, Thaddeus Stevens sharply disagreed with the way that Republican President Abraham Lincoln at first tried to fight that war. Lincoln unquestionably hated slavery, but he did not at first look upon the war as a way to achieve slavery's destruction. He sought instead simply to put the Union back together again as quickly as possible in order to return to the work of peacefully, gradually, eventually seeing the end of slavery occur. And doing that, Lincoln at first believed, required interfering with slavery during the war as little as possible in order to annoy ruffling Southern feathers any more than was absolutely necessary. Thaddeus Stevens considered this strategy deeply wrongheaded. He saw the war as an opportunity to do away with slavery and do that swiftly and thoroughly. And he believed furthermore that union victory in the war required supplementing a purely military struggle with a frontal attack against slavery. That because slavery was the mainstay of Southern society and the Southern war effort. So in Stephen's eyes, the two struggles were inseparable. The first could not be won without waging the second. That is, secession could not be defeated without destroying slavery. In pressing for this radical war strategy, Stevens was therefore among the first to champion confiscating the slaves of rebels, to demand full legal freedom for slaves who were so confiscated, to demand bringing African Americans into the unions until then lily white armies, to call for widening the scope of emancipation, to include all slaves within the rebellious states. And he was among the first to press for outlawing slavery throughout the United States as a whole. That is to press for an abolitionist constitutional amendment. Stevens did that a full year before Abraham Lincoln endorsed that idea. As Stevens came to see, taking steps like these would mean a radical transformation, a social and political revolution in Southern society. Stevens fully embraced that transformation. He repeatedly argued that in his words, quote, we must treat this war as a radical revolution and revolutionize Southern institutions, habits, and manners. The very foundations of their institutions must be broken up and relayed or else all our blood and treasure will have been spent in vain." End quote. Eventually, Lincoln and the Republican Party did adopt most of these measures but Stevens' efforts were absolutely key to accomplishing that because Stevens' words helped to reshape public opinion. Newspapers regularly published speeches he gave both in Lancaster and on the floor of the House of Representatives. And many of those speeches were then reprinted as pamphlets, distributed sometimes in hundreds of thousands of copies nationwide. And changes in public opinion, partially brought about by the spread of such ideas, induced or permitted other people, including Abraham Lincoln, to move eventually in the direction to which Stevens was pointing. Stevens told the journalist, therefore, later in life that, quote, some of the papers call me the leader of the House of Representatives. <laughs> 
And he added, I lead them, yes, but they never follow me or do as I want them until public opinion has sided with me. Stevens' fellow Pennsylvania Republican, Alexander McClure, was thus convinced that in his words, had Stevens not declared for the abolition of slavery as soon as the war began and pressed it in and out of season, Lincoln could not have issued the Emancipation Proclamation as early as he did, end quote. In 1864, the Republican Party tried to broaden its electoral base on the eve of new presidential elections by attracting pro-war Democrats to its banner. And for that purpose, it nominated Tennessee Senator and former slaveholder, Andrew Johnson, for vice president. Thaddeus Stevens did not like that idea and objected, but objected in vain. And when Lincoln's assassination in 1865 elevated Andrew Johnson to the presidency, that accidental president began to help the old Southern elite to regain political power after the war and help them to force the former slaves down into a new form of subordination. At that point, Stevens vigorously pushed Congress to impeach Johnson and remove him from office an effort that came within reach of success. In making the case for removing Johnson, Stevens argued for an understanding of impeachment that remains very relevant to our own time. Many, if not most members of his party held to what was a narrow interpretation of that phenomenon, according to which a president could be removed from office only for breaking some specific law. Stevens, however, upheld a broader interpretation. He insisted that a president could be discharged from office for abusing or failing conscientiously to carry out the duties of office. He said, quote, in order to sustain impeachment under our constitution, I do not hold that it is necessary to prove a crime as an indictable offense. Impeachment, he said, is a purely political affair. It is intended as a remedy for improper conduct in office and to prevent the continuance of improper conduct. So he said, if an officer of the government abuses his trust or attempts to pervert it, to improper purposes, he becomes rightly subject to impeachment and removal from office." End quote. Now that view, which I think was consistent with what the Constitution's framers had in mind, remains very relevant, if still very co controversial to this day. Well, as noted, Stevens failed to remove Johnson, but he did become a prime mover behind the 14th Amendment, which provided for equal treatment before the law for all in America and birthright citizenship, citizenship in the United States and in the state of residence for all people born or under the jurisdiction, naturalized under the jurisdiction of the United States. And he then called insistently for a 15th Amendment that would provide for voting rights for African-Americans, an urging that was cut short only by Thaddeus Stevens' death. Well, how does someone become a person like Thaddeus Stevens? That's one of the things I set out to learn when I began to work on this book. One of the people who knew Stevens best later observed about such people that sometimes such a person, his words, seems to come forth like Minerva from the hand of Jove, fully developed and equipped at all points for the work. 
But in other cases, it would appear that a long course of vigorous training is required to fit this destined leader for his work, end quote. And this observer clearly suggested that was the case with Thaddeus Stevens. And I think that those words capture a truth about seemingly larger of life, larger than life people in general, as well as about Stevens in particular. Such outstanding historical figures, heroes, leaders, whatever we choose to call them, rarely, if ever, already appear whole, complete in the egg, so to speak. The people they finally become, the people that history comes to know, usually are the product of the interaction among three things. First, whatever innate qualities they may have. Second, early influences upon them. And third, the circumstances in which they find themselves later in life. And that was certainly true, I came to see as I studied the subject of Thaddeus Stevens. The combination of influences crucially shaped him in his early years. Those influences included political traditions in the state where he was born and raised, which was Vermont, his family's Baptist religious views, and the content of his formal secondary education and then college education. Previous biographers I also discovered had paid very little attention to those subjects, but I concluded that they do much to explain Stephen's later conduct. He began life in a poor farm family in Vermont, began it in the aftermath of major social and political struggles there, struggles by small farmers for rights to their land and struggles by those same people for a democratic form of government. His family immersed him in the Baptist faith, which prized individual conscience, personal choice, and mutual assistance, and also prized at least a rough degree of economic equality in the community. His schooling exposed him to the Greek and Roman classics and to faculty members and books alike that were steeped in the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment's emphasis on the power of human reason and that were similarly devoted to what was then called a free labor system and which today is known as capitalism. Some of these influences actually contradicted one another, conflicted with one another. And over the course of his life, as he evaluated events that occurred around him and grappled with challenges that arose before him, Stevens would and would have to iron out those inconsistencies, would have to resolve those contradictions. What emerged from that process was a more and more consistent determination and effort to free his country's institutions, in his own words, from every vestige of human oppression, of inequality of rights, of the recognized degradation of the poor and the superior caste of the rich. A colleague later said of Thaddeus Stevens that, quote, nature had given him a generous heart as a result of which he seemed to feel that every wrong inflicted upon the human race was a blow struck at himself. The wrongs that so deeply troubled Stevens, that so deeply pained him, Stevens himself traced to the denial of democratic rights and to the absence of a fuller, more meaningful form of equality than the one that prevailed. And that general outlook drove Stevens' hostility to and struggle to abolish slavery. Stevens' plan for reconstructing the South after the war did not stop at legal and political change. The region's economic and social structure, he decided, must be transformed 
II. And central to such renovation was the seizure of rebel planters' landed property and the distribution of that landed property among former slaves in the form of small farms. That, Stevens believed, would create a more egalitarian, Republican, small r, society. It would also give Black voters the economic independence they would need, he thought, in order to resist political intimidation by white employers, employers who would be able to hire them and presumably use that power to pressure them if African Americans did not have the means to feed and support themselves and their families. Stevens did not originate the idea of land reform. African Americans did. Slaves and free people fought for land even in the midst of the war. They began working the soil owned by rebels who fled as Union armies approached. Stevens strongly supported those efforts on the part of the slaves and former slaves and sought to expand those efforts and consecrate them in law. He said, quote, it is impossible that any practical equality of rights can exist where a few thousand men monopolize the whole landed property. For how can Republican institutions, free public schools, free churches, free social interaction exist in a mingled community of nabobs and serfs, end quote, creating and safeguarding precisely those institutions required seizing and redistributing the land of the elite. Now, as a young man just out of college and heavily influenced by the books assigned to him there, Stevens had accepted differences in wealth among the population as inevitable byproducts of economic progress. But now the revolutionary transformation that he sought to accomplish in the country compelled Stevens more than ever to see an extreme economic inequality, a severe threat to political democracy. While Stevens, by the end of the Civil War, was a prominent Republican Party floor leader whose proposals had often proved essential throughout the war itself. And as a result of that proven ability to foresee what was needed, he enjoyed great authority among Republicans in Congress. But on this subject, very few of his colleagues were willing to follow him. Just one day after Stevens introduced his bill to redivide the land of the Southern elite, the House overwhelmingly rejected it. Just one day later, and more than two thirds of the Republicans who voted joined the Democrats in opposition and another 10 Republicans abstained from the vote. Why? Why did congressional Republicans reject these land reform proposals? Because they made clear, they rejected the idea of infringing upon the private property rights of landowners. The challenge of treason and armed rebellion had reconciled these Northern politicians to the abolition of a form of property that they considered, that they already considered sinful and illegitimate, that is, property in human beings. But most of them balked at the idea of infringing, especially in peacetime, upon claims to another form of property, property and land, that remained as close to their hearts as ever before. Furthermore, Republicans also worried aloud where if they began redistributing landed property to exploited and impoverished people, the road would lead them. So the Republican New York Times warned them that, quote, if Congress is to take cognizance 
of the claims of labor against capital, there can be no decent pretense for confining the task to the slave labor of the South. It is instead a question of the fundamental relation of industry to capital. And sooner or later, if begun at the South, it will find its way into the cities of the North." End quote. Boston newspaper echoed that fear. It worried that opposing the existence of landed aristocracies, quote, is too edged, since there are socialists who hold that any aristocracy is anathema, including the economic elite of the North. Thaddeus Stevens became terminally ill during 1868 at age 76. By which time the hard won achievements of the second American revolution were already under threat. Under threat from a resurgent layer of white supremacists in the South and from the rise of political conservatism in the North and within the Republican Party itself. In a dark mood, therefore, Thaddeus Stevens told the journalist that his principal regret is that I have lived so long and so uselessly. But others held his achievements in higher regard. Two African-American ministers came to his bedside, prayed for him, prayed with him, and assured him that the rest of the country's black population was doing the same. When Stevens died that August, a racially integrated core of pallbearers carried his body to the Capitol's rotunda to lay in state, flanked there by an honor guard of black Union soldiers. Some 20,000 mourners attended the funeral in Pennsylvania. Post-war conventions of free people praised him as, quote, a beacon of light of our race, end quote. Frederick Douglass hung a portrait of Thaddeus Stevens on his wall. A fellow radical Republican observed approvingly that Stevens, quote, brought the spirit of John Brown into the work of the statesman, end quote. Stevens wrote his own epitaph, which was chiseled onto the face of his monument in a racially integrated cemetery in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as I'm sure you all know. It said, let me remind you this, I repose in this quiet and secluded spot, not from any natural preference for solitude, but finding other cemeteries limited as to race by charter rules. I have chosen this, that I might illustrate in my death the principles which I advocated through a long life, equality of man before his creator." End quote. I think this is a good time to remember Thaddeus Stevens, to remember his world and to what he helped to accomplish in that world. So many of the issues central to his story are back in the news today. Numerous state and local governments are targeting the voting rights of national minorities. The Supreme Court has aided such efforts by invalidating key sections of the 1965 Voting Rights Act the kind of extreme economic inequality that Stevens came to deplore has in our own time come under intense public scrutiny. But powerful politicians and equally powerful media outlets still work hard to denounce and dismantle even our threadbare social safety net and to blame poverty upon the poor. The wanton and unpunished killing of unarmed black people by police and white supremacist vigilantes recalls the terror that white supremacists imposed in the South to kill reconstruction in 
and against which Thaddeus Stevens fought. So perhaps in reacquainting ourselves with the things that someone like Thaddeus Stevens stood for and worked so hard to accomplish in his time, we may gain inspiration and courage and confidence in fighting for at least some of the things that need to be done in our own time. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Bruce. Um, we've had a good series of questions that have uh, been flowing in as you've been speaking. Um, and I'm sure there will be more that will arrive <clears throat> As we uh, discussed, but let me um, let me share a few with you. One very interesting one, uh, I believe, is coming from North Carolina. Uh, where, how would you distinguish Lincoln's original attitudes towards slavery uh, and the South from James Buchanan's attitude uh, towards slavery in the South? Well, lines of distinction there. Very, very different. Very, very different. Um, James Buchanan, in his own words, uh, built his national political standing on his defense of what the Southern slaveholders called their rights. And he said as much repeatedly. He was also a co-author of a manifesto issued by a series of democratic diplomats calling for the acquisition of Cuba peacefully or by force, which was precisely an item high on the agenda of Southern slave owners who planned to turn Cuba into a slave state in the United States. James Buchanan sat on his hands as Southern states began to pull out of the union, declaring simultaneously that secession was unconstitutional and that the federal government had no power to prevent it. Abraham Lincoln differed with him all down these lines. Abraham Lincoln was an opponent of the slave owning elite of the South. He came to hate slavery from an early age. He never had political standing in the South and hardly sought it. He sought his support among anti-slavery Northerners and he achieved that. He came into office seeking to uh, prevent the spread of slavery, believing that by so doing, he could accelerate the strangulation of slavery where it already existed. And over the course of the Civil War, Lincoln took all those steps that James Buchanan certainly never would have taken had he even tried to put down secession with the use of armed force. Um, Lincoln put them into effect, Buchanan never would have done so. It's hard to imagine two individuals further apart on the key questions of the day. Okay. Um, another one of our uh, attendees tonight would like you to reconcile what he sees as two um, kind of opposing uh, viewpoints of uh, Stevens. How does Stevens reconcile, or how do we reconcile, uh, his denial of the right to vote uh, for urban laborers with his support for the right to vote for black men, few of whom owned property? Smart question. <laughs> Stevens in the 1830s emphasized that he did not oppose the right to vote for what he called honest, upright, white working people in Pennsylvania. What he thought should be done, however, those he thought should be excluded were those who had, as we would say, no visible means of support, who were itinerants, um, but not itinerant workers, people who drifted from one place to another, as he uh, put it in rough language, who washed their cravats in mud holes and slept in barns. Um, it's unclear how many people, in fact, the restriction that he advocated and that in fact was introduced into the Pennsylvania Constitution actually disfranchised. But it needs to be clear that Stevens, while he opposed genuinely universal uh, male, uh, male suffrage uh, 
in Pennsylvania um, did not mean to exclude the general run of white working people. In the case of uh, blacks, he would have applied uh, the exact same standard. He never said that uh, if he came across any African American uh, in Pennsylvania who had no such means of support, he would insist upon enfranchising them. What he demanded was the same standard be applied to both black and white men. And so I think actually there isn't anything to be reconciled there. I can't hear you, Tom. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, a couple questions related to nativism, one from the West Coast. Uh, how do you assess Stephen's nativist tendencies? I want to combine that with um, uh, another question here. Comment on, if you will, Stephen's involvement, oddly inconsistent, in nativism and no know nothingism uh, during his political life in the 1850s and his Whig alignment. Um, and his early role in the Republican Party's founding. I think, I think to answer that question, we need first of all to look back to his uh, to his youth. The Baptist faith in which into which he was born is very jealous of its rights and stood for a broad degree of religious freedom. The state of Vermont passed, as I said earlier, a very democratic form of constitution, and it extended religious freedom rather broadly. It did not, however, extend religious equality to Catholics. There was a widespread belief among many sections of the Protestant population that Catholicism was anti-Republican, small r, anti-Republican, um, and uh, was a danger to republics, that uh, they were simply automatons run from the Vatican and were, again, dangers to a republic. And it's very likely that Thaddeus Stevens absorbed that viewpoint. Moreover, many of the immigrants coming over in, in that era were quite poor, Many of them were Catholics. Many of them moved into the cities, which Thaddeus Stevens distrusted. Stevens, like many others of his background, distrusted large cities. Um, and as I said, it is to those large cities that immigrants disproportionately moved because they had no means to get onto the land. And so it was that Stevens undoubtedly was at the very least soft on nativism. On the other hand, Stevens was never a very vocal champion of restricting the rights of immigrants. More likely, he hooked up with the nativists for what I think we'd have to call politically opportunistic mm -hmm. reasons. He needed a new base of support. They seemed to be available. They agreed with him on a whole host of other issues, including economic development. And he saw no reason not to uh, join up with them. It only looks to be uh, as the year 1860 approaches that Stevens begins to back away from that point of view. He champions the cause of Chinese immigrants in California, surprisingly, given his background. And he also takes note of the fact that large numbers of immigrants, especially the German speaking ones, were strongly critical of slavery. And so when the Republican Party in 1860 nationally adopts a pro-immigrant anti-nativist platform, there's no indication that Lincoln objects. So this seems to me another subject on which Stevens changes his mind as his democratic commitment deepens during the course of his life. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna switch into a different area um, and uh, ask you to comment on what we know about Stephen's position with regard to women and the vote. Well, I won't use the papal we or the royal we because I suspect other people know more about that. 
than I do. What I do know is that um, later on in life, in, I believe, Lancaster, Stevens joins a public debate on the subject of women's rights and makes clear his support for women's suffrage. Uh, and that makes perfect sense because radical Republicans included a disproportionate number of people, men included, who saw in the cause of women's suffrage consistent application of the democratic principles for which they generally stood. Mm -hmm. So other than your book, uh, what is needed for Americans to restore a more accurate um, picture of Stevens uh, and uh, be able to appreciate the powerful reputation that he enjoyed in his lifetime or experienced in his lifetime? Well, it's very tempting to say nothing else is needed except my book. So buy it, give it to your friends as gifts, distribute them freely to the people on the street. More so seriously, you might say something about uh, you know a museum that, that could be established. Yes, indeed, well. that's a, but no, a that's good point. A good point. <laughs> um, perhaps a museum could be created in his uh, and Mrs. Smith's memory that would attract people and therein explain what uh, they stood for. Finally, Hollywood could get into the act. I think they did a bad job of depicting Steven's real politics in Steven Spielberg's movie, Lincoln, some time ago. St Stevens there appears, at least on the right side of uh, the question of abolition, but he's depicted as being too radical, um, impractical, therefore a, a hindrance to the actual achievement of abolition, has to be talked into muffling his politics. None of that, I think, is true. You'd never know from that movie that Thaddeus Stevens, as I mentioned earlier, called for the uh, uh, 13th Amendment the year before Lincoln signed on to that project. Um, and the film makes it look like he's advocating some toned down version of his beliefs when on the floor of the House, he calls for equality before the law. Equality before the law was not a moderate goal in that time period. And so um, I, I would love to see Hollywood re-examine re its views and its representation of Stevens. Since people watch movies more readily than they read books or even go to museums, that would be an important step. Mm -hmm. So if we could rewind the clock and um, prevent Mr. Lincoln from going to the Ford's Theater <clears throat> on that fateful night in April. Could you speculate what might have happened uh, to Reconstruction uh, had Lincoln lived for, say, another 20 years? Well, if Lincoln had lived for another 20 years, he wouldn't have been serially reelected for those 20 years. He would have completed the term, I think, uh, to which he was elected in 1864. I can't speculate about whether he would have sought a third term, I doubt it. Um, and if, however, he had lived, I'm quite certain he would have reacted to uh, the attempts to restore the Southern elite to power more strongly than did Andrew Johnson, who basically gave that elite uh, a virtual carte blanche but more importantly, and uh, over the longer run, it's my opinion, I'm sorry to say, that nobody was going to be in a position to fundamentally alter the course that history was about to take. The forces behind genuine equality, a genuine biracial democracy were simply too weak. And those in favor of subordinating African-Americans were by comparison too strong. The North was never strongly convinced of the virtues of genuine racial equality. Most of what they had supported, they did so for pragmatic reasons. They grew tired of that struggle, certainly 
by the early 1870s. And I don't think any single individual, no matter how talented, no matter how eloquent, no matter how energetic, could have changed uh, the consequences that those facts created. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me reframe the question then. Let's suppose that, that Stevens had lived another 10 years. Um, any speculation as to how things may have shaken out with regard to reconstruction or uh, did your, does your previous answer still hold? I'm afraid the previous answer does still hold because um, it wasn't simply Stevens who was dying. Other radical Republicans were also dying or failing to be reelected to office or becoming themselves demoralized and others moving to the right. So even the survival of this individual who remember was already 76 years old in 1868. Um, could not, I think, have changed the equation. Mm -hmm. um, do we know anything about where Stevens stood with regard to um, Native Americans and in particular, the land grabs and, and the land stolen from Native Americans? I did not come across Stevens directly um, advocating a more uh, egalitarian and uh, equitable treatment of Native Americans. I did come across his objection to attempts to add to the military force directed against them and his dismissal of claims that such increased military force was necessary because Native Americans were wantonly taking uh, the lives of so-called white Americans. And Stevens said on that occasion that it's too bad the Native Americans didn't have newspapers the way the whites did, because if they did, they would be reporting on these incidents of violence and showing very different facts underlying them. Because, says Stevens, more often than not, more often than not, it is whites who are beginning the violence, not Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Are there any lessons that we can take um, from Thaddeus Stevens on pushing the Overton window today? with regard to police brutality, uh, racial biases, and economic injustices? Well, I, I certainly think so. I certainly think so. Um, that is Stephen's watchword was not compromise, much less compromise at any price. When things he thought needed to be accomplished could not be accomplished, he was savvy enough to recognize that and accepts the second best outcome. But he also said on such occasions, this is not the very best outcome. This is not what really needs to happen. Here's what needs to happen. And hopefully in the future, we can return to this subject and address it the right way. But for now, we, we can't seem to accomplish that. Thaddeus Stevens fought against official violence against African-Americans in uh, the early years of Reconstruction, white riots broke out throughout the South, notably in Memphis and in New Orleans. Thaddeus Stevens was enraged by this violence and for that reason called for uh, 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 beefing up the military support to the rights and lives of African Americans in the South. I think had he lived, or better to say, were he living today and ambulatory, that is Stevens, <coughs> excuse me, the old man's voice is giving out as I'm sure you can hear, that is Stevens would have been marching in the street in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations last summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that answers a question that had just come up uh, across the board here a minute ago. Um, if Stevens could view our nation today, what might his reaction be to the current political, social, and economic situation? And I think, uh, I think you just answered that. Um, in your research, uh, Bruce, where, where would you direct others to find uh, great material 
great sources on Stephen for their particular collections that were especially strong and helpful in your research? Yes, there are two volumes of Stephen's uh, speeches and uh, his papers, including uh, letters sent to him, as well as uh, uh, other memos uh, related to Stevens. Those are an invaluable source. They, in turn, are based on microfilm collections of Stevens, which, of course, are available to you only if you have a microfilm reader. Uh, but a microfilm collection that was put together painstakingly over a good year, a good deal of time, by the same people who then selected from them to make those two volumes, the selected papers of Thaddeus Stevens, which are still in print. So those are excellent. You can also get the Congressional uh, uh, Globe online. Uh, and so if you've got enough determination and patience, you can find Stevens' congressional speeches there yourself. There's a follow-up question here. Thank you for that. Uh, to the, uh, if Stevens were out on the streets today, um, what in particular, where did that question go now? Uh, it just maybe it's in the chat here. Yes, what specifically do you believe Stevens would have supported in the Black Lives Matters movement? Well, this is this this is uh, asking a lot. This is uh, asking for a high degree of speculation since mm -hmm. he. Uh, he, he lived in a very different era. Um, I, would, I can tell you what I would like to think Thaddeus Stevens would have called for. He would have called for, he would have called for bringing those who shot down unarmed black men to court, charging them with the appropriate crime and punishing them where that was in accordance with the facts for murder. Mm -hmm. and making it clear that this would be done consistently instead of what numerous surveys have found, uh, which is when such killings occur today, the vast majority of cases, they're never brought to court. And those that do go to court are usually dismissed by juries who have a, an inclination, a disposition toward the police rather than toward the victims of police violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. One final question. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but do you feel that you satisfactorily answered those two questions that you set out uh, to address in your book? And if there was an area you would go back to to dig deeper, what might it be? You can always go back and dig deeper. Uh, that's something that I always, I've always found. And for that matter, I've always had that inclination. So when a book of mine is published, I invariably sit down with it with a pencil in hand and begin to make notations in the margin of what was badly written and what I should have firmed up or amplified. So if I were to write that same book now, I think it would be a better book. And if I were to write it in two years from now, I imagine it would be better still. Um, it's hard to say what other sources I would have gone to. I should have mentioned in response to the earlier question about what sources others can seek, that one source that really is hardly available to anyone is his own written correspondence because Thaddeus Stevens' handwriting was one of the worst I have ever seen. <laughs> and many of his own correspondents complained to him that they could not make out what his chicken scrawl was trying to tell them. Uh, so that, although we have a whole, therefore a whole stack of his letters, they often remain um, closed with seven seals to most of us. Well, well Bruce, I wanna thank you for an enlightening presentation um, and, and really for a remarkable book. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation tonight. I know that our many, many listeners have as well. And uh, we wish you good health in this pandemic period. And uh, again, thank you so much for your, your time with us this evening. Thank I you. I also want to thank everyone who attended tonight. Um, upon exiting the Zoom, a window is going to pop up um, and it's a post event survey. And we'd love to know your thoughts about tonight's program and your ideas for any future programming. 
we'd all we'll also be posting a recording of tonight's presentation on YouTube in the upcoming days. So be on the lookout uh, for that and for future programming at our website, lancasterhistory.org. Thanks once again and have a wonderful evening.